something very soothing about being in these places. What places, I hear you say? These places. Because around this village vicinity, this is the only place where invariably you'll never be disturbed. And that for me is precious. It's a very precious commodity. So I've got my own little patch of lawn the birds and the squirrels in here are just chilled and the squirrels all around here I'm sure they all know me because I feed them and whenever I open my windows and look down to where I feed them and I can see the bird table they look at me like this and just carry on <laughs> they're not bothered and you know if you look at squirrel videos on YouTube you'll see how super clever they are they are really clever and not only are they clever but they make better house pets than cats or dogs they're friendly they're loving they love playing they love being tickled they are adventurous, they want to check everything out. I've watched videos whereby people have helped injured squirrels or like baby squirrels that have dropped out the nest or something. And then when the, the squirrel's grown up, they don't want to go outside. They have a little bit of a, a sniff and maybe they'll go out and, and you know bounce on the grass but then boom, 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 they'll bop back into the house. And they've become house squirrels so they're all around here and if they're anything like crows and seagulls and lots of other birds they have facial recognition and they've got long memories and I've told stories before about the seagulls when I was living down in the Algarve when I would go to have a look at their young when they're in their nest, you know, just little fluffy birds like this. If I go to have a look, see, you know, how many there were, and what's going on on top of the cliff, then they'd attack me. And then after that, every single day for two years, the mother of these birds remembered who I was and just attacked me and attacked me and attacked me until in the end, the other seagulls started to attack her to shut her mouth up. Because it was like, it's been two years, you know, are you going to let it go now or what? And so this bird would be dived by me, and then other birds would come and attack her and start biting her wings in the air, telling them to piss off. Unbelievable. Talking about holding a grudge, you've heard the saying, nothing worse than a woman scorned. Well... I put seagulls a close second to that. So, uh, yeah. You know, you feel the energy here and away from traffic and noise, and you, all you can hear is the birds. And it's beautiful. It's very befitting for my state of mind. So, this video today. I'm going to be speaking about how I don't think we're autonomous creatures. And I've spoken many times in the past about the automaton. You know, these sheep-like people, automated followers. But I don't think any of us are any different. It's just whether we realise it or not. 
Now, all my life, my family have called me golden bollocks. Because it doesn't matter where I go or what I get up to, I always end up benefiting substantially from whatever mire I'd gotten myself into. And even, you know, recent times, you know, my elder brother, he go, oh, golden bollocks, you know, it doesn't matter what's going to happen to him, you know, everything's just going to be just fine. And uh, it was. In actual fact, everything was over fine, it was perfect. No changes at all. My apartment just waiting for me. The British government just waiting for me. The world just patiently waiting for my return. And so, in recent times I spoke to you about my writing this book and how I'd struggled with this um, editing package called Grimali how it was taking the humanism out of whatever I was writing and it wanted to write in staccato which is to say in short sentences with no euphemism no nuance no ambiguity none of those humanisms it wanted me to state exactly what I meant and it's kind of like well you couldn't do that with poetry if a poet wanted to help wanted some help with his or her work it would destroy the soul of the poetry and so what I'm concluding is that this AI of course it doesn't know anything about nuance it doesn't know anything about subtleties it doesn't know anything about hues and uh, and just a gentle fluid and flowing of the English language uh, being open to ambiguity and all the colour that the English language has when used you know like poets do or, or good writers so when I was working with that package I felt that it was destroying what I was writing and it wanted me to change the whole structure completely every comma and you know putting new words in and taking words out and asking me do I really want to use that word when I'm using wonderful if I'm using wonderful it wants me to use something like beautiful or you know exceptional and I'm like I want to use wonderful for a very heartfelt reason I want to use wonderful and so I've stopped using it and I've gone back over all of those chapters and I've put the love back into what I've been writing and so all five of them now have been revamped and they're all ready and some of you may have found that uh, the links weren't working or there was some um, grammatical errors and spelling mistakes and that well that won't be the case anymore and um, so they are neon perfect so I'm just um, working uh, through chapter 6 now which is the entheogen that's to say psychedelics it's a powerful chapter people and the ramifications are huge and so I've got 22 pages so far and I'll probably be wrapping it up about 30 pages and then I've been moving on to the main body of the book because I haven't even started on the main body of the book. What I've been doing is I have been setting the scene. I've been placing the foundation of what it is that I'm going to be addressing. And what I'm going to be addressing is very deep and profound and it most certainly can't be grammarified it most certainly can't be pigeonholed and it will not be put into categories of right or wrong because when you deal with this stuff there's no right or wrong you're dealing with pure spirit and the essence of the universe and 
all quantum physicists know that the essence of the universe is a very peculiar thing. And so when we get involved with that realm, we know that the universe is conscious. And it is a thinking thing. And there are no mistakes in the universe. Every single thing that the universe has created, it has thought about. And everything has validity. Even if sometimes we may not recognize the validity ourselves. And we may not like the idea of like poisonous creatures and venomous snakes and all this sort of thing. But ecologically, mythologically, spiritually, they are very meaningful and they are a very integral part of the cosmos. And that's why symbolism of snakes and dragons have been so powerful in our mythology. And incidentally, the dragon is just a snake with wings basically because when you look into uh, Chinese symbolism and you look at the dragon basically it's a serpent with wings and of course dragons are myth mythological and so it's a mythological snake it's got more powers than you would think the average snake would have so back to the main crux of this video where I'm looking at my life now and I look back and every single step I've taken seems to have been preordained. It's led further up the mountain. There's been a rhyme and a reason and a purpose and I've not created any empires. I haven't invented anything which saves lives. If I should die tomorrow there'd be nothing that the awakened brave has left behind other than a few verses of semi-useful philosophy. But we're only looking at that from the, the abstract. You're looking at me as a being in a time and a place. But you see, what's going on here, people, is something vastly over and above that. When we look for meaning and purpose and rhyme and reason, with humanity and we ask ourselves why have we been created why did we evolve to what avail what are we serving what we are serving in the bigger picture ladies and gentlemen is something which is immensely important because we know not of any other creature which has our level of sentience and consciousness we alone as far as we know are the only creatures that can question our existence, that can question the universe, that can question God, the Creator. We are the ones that are questioning all things. And so we ask ourselves, well, why are we doing that? Why have we been given? Why have we evolved with an ability to be able to look at ourselves to have self-awareness and to, to be able to gather all this information and data and analyse the very beings that we are and our position in the universe. Why is this? Well, it's twofold. One is for humanity on a whole, because look what we're doing. Over all these thousands of years that we've been on this earth, we are gathering data and we are passing it down we're passing the baton onto our offspring and they are going forward with the information. And now, when we think about it, in this last 20 years, look at the massive amount of data that we've got at our fingertips. Just about everything you could ever imagine. That information is on the internet somewhere. And it's... it's it really is astounding to think that somebody somewhere has put something up about some things. And if I was to look on the internet for information in relation to blades of grass, 
then I'm sure there'll be copious amounts of videos which are going to be explaining blades of grass it, it, with all their finery in great detail and speaking about the science and about the spiritual connection and all different sorts of things somebody somewhere has done it so what I consider is happening is that consciousness is living vicariously through us consciousness lives vicariously through all living creatures even through blades of grass because blades of grass have their own level of sentience and they can feel when the, the sun is up and, 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 and they know when it's time to grow and they know when it's time to stop pushing all the, the vital nutrients out uh, to to extend their, their size and volume they know when to retain that when the cold weather's coming there's genius just in this and it's come about through billions of years and so this thing is having an experience and if you could talk it would have a story to tell now when we look at water it is said that water holds memory there's been tests, scientific tests about this people and one person uh, was, was a, um, a Japanese guy called Dr. Imota and he did this test with water and rice some of you may be familiar with it whereby he filled, he boiled rice uh, cooked it and then left it um, in, in uh, containers and um, put uh, writing on three containers and one was like I hate you another one didn't have anything on it another one was I love you and then he would speak to these the containers of rice on a daily basis the one that's got I hate you on it he would say I hate you the next one didn't have anything on it wouldn't say anything and then the one that loved is I love you and he noticed and this test has been repeated all over the world and it, it seems to follow a pretty stringent format that when spoken to, when hearing the words love and being spoken to with that intention, that rice then stay pure much, much longer than the one which had I hate you on it. The one which had I hate you on it and received those words with that negative connotation started to rot much quicker. We know this works, people because when we are in environments which are with somebody that doesn't love us, doesn't tell us good things, just brings us down and poisons us, we know that we don't flourish in, in, in that environment. But when we're in environments whereby we are being loved, we are being respected, and we are being spoken to, lovingly and caringly then of course we flourish so we, we can see this and over years you can see in a person's face how loved they have been in their lives and with children you know their faces are like books you can read them and you can see the ones that are troubled the ones that are loved the ones that are confused the ones that are just finding every single day fascinating and absorbing all the information. And so consciousness is collating all of this information. And so there isn't really any real significance to the individual. There's only significance in the universe to living organisms on mass and so when we look at the human being through its stages of evolution assuming that we came from cavemen then we will see how we've evolved and all the information that we've collated and stored and passed on well all that information now is in the ether via radio waves, internet, but this information in relation to 
the world and human beings was always in the ether because the ancient Hindus have written about it and they called it the Akasha. Some of you will have heard of the Akashic records which just means it's information which is in the ether. Everything is there already and it's like everything that's ever been said, thought of or done there is a record of it in there and this is why when we have people like Einstein and Newton and uh, Michelangelo and, and all these brilliant people when they've been asked where this information comes from where does their genius come from they've got no explanation for it, it, it and you know composers you know Beethoven, and even in, you know, recent times, with like McCartney, he recites that one day, you know, about, um, you know, yesterday, he just woke up and he had the, 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 the theme of yesterday, and he had no words for it, he just had da 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 and then he went around for a couple of weeks with all of his friends saying, oh, I've got all this too, have you heard it? I'm sure it's to something. And everyone's going, no, 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 no. And it turns out that nobody had heard it. It was, down, it was downloaded to him. And so then he wrote yesterday. And it's the world's best-selling song. And that came out of the ether, people. And, you know, Michelangelo would say when people would ask him, how do you know how to cut off exactly the right amount from a six-foot statue and he would say well because the statue is already in there the image, the entity is already in that marble and all I'm doing is I'm just chipping off the excess and so he saw it how did he see it? how did he comprehend all the dimensions? because if you or I were to do it then we, we would really we wouldn't know where to start would we? Because you've got to take into consideration every last dimension of the fingers and, and the, the contours and the creases and everything. And you, you can't afford to make a single mistake. Because in one finger, if you cut a little bit too much off, it's wrong. And a flaw could be found. And that would never do. And then, with people like Beethoven, he would say that his composures mostly just came written. And he would close his eyes and he would see them all written. All he had to do was copy them down. And so similar with Einstein, you know, his inspiration came out of a dream. Um, when he coined E equals MC squared. So, the information is out there, people. And what I'm saying here is that in my life, I've had a certain journey which has now given to a certain story being told of what I've concluded and what I've concluded is pertaining to my personal experience. It's unique. It's absolutely unique. I've not collated any information from other people. It's all about what my experience has been. And so when I put that information down and then it's printed and then people read it, they'll read an extraordinary life. A life which is filled with supernatural, extraordinary experiences. What do they mean to anybody else? Nothing concrete. But for people who have had similar experiences, or have been touched in a similar sort of spiritual way, then the book is going to mean something to them. And maybe it will inspire them to try to achieve some of the things I've achieved. Uh, maybe it will inspire them to write their version. But one thing's for sure, once the information is out there, it's not going to be a deficit to the world. It's going to be a positive addition. And so, me making these videos, 
whether the videos stand the test of time. Invariably, most of them don't because I've always took my channels down or they've been taken down. But I've said things and you've heard them. And they're in your consciousness. And if they're in your consciousness, they're in the consciousness which is ever pervasive. So effectively, all what I'm saying now is going straight out of my mouth into the Akasha. But not only is my words going into the Akasha at the moment in time, they're also going into the new variety of Akasha, which is Wi-Fi. It's the same thing, people. In the old days, people were saying that all information is in the ether, and this is our antennae, and we tap into that, we tune into it, and then we can download it. Well, now, we just tune into uh, Google's super... Uh, storehouses and we download them with gadgetry don't we and so it's a it's a it's a technological storage facility and download whereas before it was still technological but there was no proof of any binary mechanism which was taking place because all data is stored in binary which is zeros and ones in certain sequences so our brain does that automatically. The universe does it automatically. And Neil deGrasse Tyson was on one of his talks with, I think it was someone called Simon Gates. He's a theoretical physicist. And he was speaking to Tyson saying that computers are written in exactly the same language as the universe. And Tyson's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me get this right. Are you saying that the, the, the computer language that we've invented is the same language that the universe ha has used to create the universe? And he said, yes. Exactly. And so when we look at math, we haven't invented math. We've discovered it. So this information was already out there. So any of the greatest equations that have ever been discovered were already written in the ether. You see? And so, people, what I'm saying is here that what I'm doing is got nothing to do with my autonomy. I don't have any measure of control over it at all. I may think I do. People could kid themselves that they do, but I've come to realise that I, in actual fact, don't. Something happens in my mind. Information is given to me, and then I come and do the job. I'm just the universe's bitch. To, put, to be quite frank. To be... To be quite demeaning of my own existence. We're all being used by the universe. I suppose if we look at ourselves as individuated specks of consciousness then we're no different to individual neurons flying around our brains. You see, if you look at the world as a brain and all life forms on it are neurons or synapses, bites of information, then the world in the natural fact is like a, a brain, isn't it? Passing information on. And when we look at the world from above in the night time and we see the cities all lit up, then the shape of those cities is exactly the same as neurons with their tendrils going out to other little towns which look like other little uh, smaller n neurons and synapses going off, flashing here and there. It's uncanny, the similarity. And when scientists have took photos of the cosmos, delayed photos over about 30 days, with using um, uh, infrared or gamma rays, they have seen that the, the, the cosmos looks exactly the same as a brain, with all the neurons and everything exactly the same, just like looking at the Earth 
of a night time looking down at the cities. How we build the cities in the same structure and same format. As above, so below, people. It's uncanny. So I don't have any doubt about the universe being the genius behind everything. And I'm just an emissary. I'm a messenger. I'm an envoy been sent by the universe to tell you guys something that I've discovered and what's happening here is a sharing of information that really fundamentally is all that's going on people live and die and depending on how many years have passed nothing ever will be remembered I mean, we could think now that, well, all this stuff, you know, it's all in the memory banks, but are we serious to think that all the things that we have got in the memory banks now are going to be in existence in 500,000 years' time? They're going to be so overwritten, so surpassed, all the information now is going to look ridiculous. It's going to be completely non-relevant. Because we would have learned so much more, so much more deeper. We know nothing now. So when I'm making these videos, and I've always said to you guys, there's a, there's a compulsion, there's a drive. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. I just do it. It's my job. And why is it that I don't work? Well, I would say that it's because I don't want to work. But also I would say, well, because I want to do this. But do I want to do this? Or the universe, has the universe just placed me into thinking that I don't want to work and I would much rather do this. And I would much rather sit in graveyards talking to a camera than I would being out in the big wide world. I've done that. The universe took me on that ride for many years and it showed me all that stuff. And so now it knows that I am perfectly comfortable and satiated in doing what I'm doing now at my time of life, having done all that other stuff. And so I'm, I'm a bit like an elder in a village who sits outside his straw hut and every now and again one of the other village members will sit down and give him time of day and he will impart some of his wisdom and kids like listening to to grandma's and granddad's stories and then they pass them on just passing the baton people that's all I'm doing just passing the baton and so now speaking about being blessed and being golden bollocks with what I've learned in recent times how it's brought me to this position of calmness and inner stillness there's nothing to be gained anymore there's nothing to be achieved there's no purpose in playing games I'm just settling in to do my job. And my job is to try to articulate the best I possibly can the experience that I've had coupled with the knowledge and the wisdom and to pass that on to other people. And that way then, my purpose would have been fulfilled. And I could say that I fulfilled a purpose. And when I said in my first opening chapter about purpose, I was saying, well, why do people need a purpose? Isn't just being enough? It absolutely is for me, just being. Just being's my purpose. But there's an addition to just being, of course. 
because we're animated creatures. And so my animation is resulting in me making these videos. Some of you would consider that purposeful. Many of you have said that how you've deeply appreciated what I've said in the past. And so that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about sharing information which helps human beings make it through this sojourn maybe just a tad more comfortable. You see, having knowledge mostly the wiser we are the, the less pitfalls we, we will encounter and of course wisdom being the prerogative of an older person in general wisdom pertains to experience and so you have to have a lot of experience to be wise and so to pass that information on to people who haven't had as much experience and probably never will and albeit they will never feel what it's like to have the experiences that I've had. They will have the template or the knowledge of how that information was achieved, i.e. meditation or psychedelics or, um, or out-of-body experiences, um, you know, deep introspection via psychology, whatever, whatever route I've travelled, whatever levels of excavation I've set about doing. It's all been about excavation, people. I, I suppose I could call in the phrase as being a cosmic excavator. What are you, Aaron? What's your job? I'm a cosmic excavator. What? Wow. What does that mean? It means I have archaeological digs into knowledge, into consciousness, into spiritualism to extract the gems of knowledge and then I upload those gems and then I store them and then I recompile them and then send them back out into the cosmos a cosmic excavator should I change the name of the channel comments down below. I've never said it before. But let me say now, guys and girls, let me not labour for no rhyme or reason. Engage a little bit and put something down as to what you're getting from these videos. And some of your thoughts. Let me know you're out there start yourself putting some of the information out into the ether so it can be stored in the Akasha because keeping it all in here is kind of like selfish I think we have a duty we have a duty to our race our species any information that we've got we have to lay it on the table Whatever knowledge we've got, good or bad, we have to lay it on the table so other members of our species can grow from that. It's like when we look at flowers and, and trees and plants, they give, they, they're paying something forward via their pollen, via their seeds and their fruits. Always they're giving something to the community. And all these trees around here, many of you wouldn't know, but when they pollinate and a the wind blows, the pollen 
picks up the wind picks up the pollen and takes it on to another tree and that way ensures their procreation they're a community supporting each other that's how they do it and if trees don't do it via the wind then they will entice other creatures moths and flies and wasps and all different sorts of creatures like that to do their work for them to be the envoy which they send off then to other members of the species to pass the information on and so the main body of this book some of you may have seen on my pin boards I've got a lot of information up there some of those pieces of paper they're five pages deep front and back with thoughts with me musing and working things out and when I get downloads I've just got to write them down so I remember to, to bring them and include them in the book and so I've laid down the cornerstone, the foundation of now what I'm going to be conveying. And for those of you that have read the chapters so far, if you think that was a bit deep, well, you're in for a ride. You're in for a ride, people. And so myself, if I think about it now, what's the next chapter going to be? I've got no idea. I don't need to know. But when the time is right, in a few days when I've finished the chapter I'm working on, then Spirit will download that to me. And I'll wake up one morning, boom, and it'll be there. And I'll know what I'm supposed to be saying. Isn't it curious? I don't know, people. I've wrote all this stuff down, but there's there's a block there's a wall and if i try to think what what piece goes next i'm like i don't know so something i have to tell me and then when i've read back through these six chapters and it probably constitutes about 100 pages now i'm reading and i'm thinking that's beautifully structured it's very articulate it's nuanced, it keeps the reader engaged, it really is quite something. And when I'm reading these chapters, I'm reading it like it's for the first time. I'm like, who wrote that? Ah, oh, this package has gone and done some dodgy stuff whilst I've been asleep at night. And it's gone and secretly rewritten all these chapters. And then it's kind of like, ah. Oh, Kind of vague memory of me saying those things, and then kind of like, oh yeah, it was me. Funny, huh? Funny. And so I'll be finishing this chapter six within a week. Who knows? And then I'll be commencing on the rest of the book. But I've I've done my history. I've written about the dark night of the soul, why I launched upon this spiritual journey. I've done the deep meditation, I've done the outer body experiences, I've done the psychedelics, I've done the, the deep philosophy and psychology study, the dream interpretation, all the introspection and all that stuff. I've downloaded the important parts of my life's journey and now I have to start to apply what it is that spirit wants me to do and it wants me to write about the relationship that human beings have with spirit and entities called God and the psychology of religion and the philosophy of religion and spirituality and all those things so what I have to do I have to bring together the psychology the philosophy 
the ideology and the religions and the spirituality have got to bring these massive subjects together and to articulate in a way in which you the viewer are going to be able to comprehend hopefully but if you're really going to be able to comprehend it you're going to need to have travelled a little bit of the path it's like if I was to start reading um, about some deep strain of biology I know nothing of biology as a science and so I'd be lost with all the terminology and all the words and all the mythology and all that I'm like I don't know what you're talking about I've got to go back and read the elementary books on this subject matter first but you lots of you you've heard me speak about lots of the stuff before but you wouldn't have heard me now this is where we get into new territory none of you would have heard me speaking about this stuff before because this is new what came about in the last year that's why this last year has been so immensely important to me with the huge downloads I've had from spirit that journey was immensely important and it was powerful so guys and gals that'll be all for this video and um, so you know if you want to let me know um, what you've made of the chapters um, put some comments down uh, put some of your own stories down whatever I'm saying if you've got a relationship with it then just engage, partake a little bit And if not, then not. These days are, um, I'm indifferent, really. You know, because the thing is, I know all this information. It's been my experience. And nobody could tell me a single bit of it. I've already done it. And this is why, on occasion, when... when some of the people have said in the, the comments that this is like this and that's like that I'm saying look all of the stuff that I've experienced there isn't a format for it there's there's no science which studies it it's my relationship with consciousness and the universe my egoic relationship with spirit my spirit within here there's the, 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 the human operating system, which is ego, compiled with the true essence of the human being, which is spirit. And in most people, the spirit is dormant. And this is why Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. It's, a, it's an immensely powerful saying. When the disciples saw a funeral and they were wailing people deeply, troubled by the loss of their loved one and some of the apostles said to Jesus let us go and comfort these people Jesus says let the dead bury the dead let us go and speak with the living so he was making reference to the people who were spiritually awoken because there's no point in, in him or the apostles speaking to the spiritually dead the automaton they wouldn't get it and I can't speak to the automaton I have to speak to the spiritually awoken and those of you that have got a glimmer of that inside you'll be listening to me and you'll be feeling engaged with me because I'm speaking your language and so the litmus test is whether you are awoke spiritually or you're still sleeping is whether I'm touching you touching you people in the depths of your spirit with what I'm saying 
if it's just words, then I'm not touching you. So anyway, because you're here, I suppose that's a good thing. Because spirit knows that it won't be too long before you will be awakening. So it's at least putting you in the right ballpark. Watching my videos is in the right ballpark, people. So you're in the right ballpark. And of course you're all at varying degrees. Some just a little bit awoken, some very awoken. And so anyway, I'll catch you in the next video.